generally is the author of nine books. Um, her book, Settled in the Wild, won the Maine Literary Award, and she's also a contributor to our beloved Daddy's Magazine, Yankee Magazine, and the Dog Magazine. Josh Rogers, we'll be having a discussion with her, uh, is the owner of Cup of Tea, which is a loose leaf tea, sorry, loose leaf seaweed tea company, um, which I've actually had and really like. He grew up eating seaweed with his grandmother, which is where his passion came from. And he has recently, this past summer, opened a brick and mortar store called Heritage Seaweed, which is on India Street. So thank you both for being here, and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel and Sarah, for inviting us in. And Josh and I are going to, um, I'm going to talk some about my book and read some. And then we're going to talk about his new store, which is a very exciting venture. Things are changing in the seaweed world. And uh, we'll talk about that. Um, uh, before I tell you how I came to write the book, I think I'd like to read to you from the beginning of the prologue. And I'm leaning too far over. I'm going to fall right out of my seat here. Uh, I have to tell you that I've just had an eye operation. And so if I kind of stumble in my reading, it's because I can't see it that clearly. Or maybe it's because I never wrote this in the first place. <laughs> Okay, so I come from Surrey, which is in Hancock County, Down East Maine. Down East Maine, where I live, can everybody hear me? Is for me the most beautiful place on earth, even in February, even on a dark day and a sharp wind. It is ledge and cobble, spruce and white pine, mud flats that glisten like a harbor seal's wet pelt, low tide rocks covered in layer upon layer of seaweeds, and a horizon straight east across the water into sunrise in Canada. No frills. It has been for me, and I think for so many others who live here, William Blake's grain of sand, a teaching place, and we have learned something of the world from it. Within the wild fabric of this shore, in its many coves and bays, seaweeds and other lives, from barnacles to fish to birds, are bound together as they are along the shores of other places in the world. It is a tightly woven warp and woof of life, an ancient and essential system of give and take. In April, we can stand at the shore and see long lines of black birds rising and falling in undulating flight at the water's horizon, homing to their nesting islands. They are double-crested cormorants. They build their nests out of sticks and grass and the seaweeds they've ripped from underwater. Flocks of robins return. Eastern Phoebes come back to the poor chiefs. Both in a cold snap seek out the windrows of seaweeds that lie in the sun above the high tide line. There in the warm rotting tangles, kelp flies and their larvae flourish. I just want to say one word about why this seems awfully loud. Is it too loud for you? Um, why I began like that. And that is because I didn't want this to be a narrow book on seaweed. I wanted everybody to read it because I thought it, seaweed was pretty important. So I tried to lure you in um, and then bring you up against robins and phoebes and double-crested cormorants and show, show you very slowly, step by step, the complexity of this world that most of us, before uh, it became a thing that's so popular now, seemed so simple and just something we slipped over. So do you feel, Josh, that there's been a change in the way we look at seaweed in the last five or six years? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, everyone that's been coming into the shop recently has been talking about the 60 Minutes um, segment that was on seaweed farming. Um, so that's put it big into the consciousness. Um, I think just the rise of sushi, the fact that you can get it in the Hannaford 
uh, for, you know, cold case now. And then anyone who has kids knows that seaweed snacks are this hugely popular thing. Um, so there's a lot of interest in it. And uh, I just wanted to say, along the lines of what you were just talking about, um, I really thought that this was going to be some, like, very a deep dive into seaweed, um, kind of akin to, um, this, I think it was The Secret Life of Lobsters, or there was, there was a book like that maybe 10 yeah. or 15 years ago. Yeah. But what I've, what, after reading it, what I've been telling people is it's really this kind of overview snapshot of the Gulf of Maine, like right now in time, and kind of, as you were talking about, this web that seaweed is a big important part of, but kind of what's at stake against the backdrop of what we did to cod and sea urchins and shrimp and all these fisheries that have kind of gone gone away. So um, right. if you want to kind of get up to speed on the Gulf of Maine right now, it's a, it's a good place to start. Thank you. Thank you. Which brings up um, another part. Maybe I'll read the Winslow Homer part. Do you think I should? Um, so then I have a chapter. I think it's the first chapter, actually. Yeah, the Gulf of Maine. And I start with Winslow Homer. And it's the same thing I was trying to do. First of all, I consider myself an essayist, and this is a chapter book. So that really is a different way to think of it, because an essay, it's over when it's over. And a chapter book has to kind of go like that. They have, the chapters have to stick together. Um, uh, but this tries to connect uh, the Gulf of Maine to the bigger world, this whole part here. At, this, at his studio on Prout's Neck in 1885, Winslow Homer completed his iconic painting of a Gulf of Maine fisherman, The Fog Warning. In 1883, when he was 47 years old, Homer had moved to this peninsula, which lies on the east side of the Scarborough River estuary, a few miles south of Massacre Pond, the site of a 17th century battles between settlers and the native tribes. The peninsula reaches straight into the Gulf of Maine without any island buffers. From his studio on the second floor of his converted carriage house, the painter began his late great works of weather and rocks and water, and of course the people for whom this was home, that have become part of the American imagination. In a real immediate sense, the Gulf of Maine belongs to all of us through these canvases, which tell us something of who, who we are in the world. You probably know the fog warning. The fisherman rowing his dory to the mothership, a dark bank of fog rolling in across the water toward him. Because of the water's swell, the inside of his dory is pitched upward in our direction, and in the hull lie two enormous dead halibut, the beautiful, tasty monster fish that were once common in our inshore waters. By Homer's time, the halibut catch had just started its nosedive, and inshore halibut fishermen hired themselves out to larger ships that sailed offshore for the fish that remained. This is what you see in the painting, a fisherman rowing his catch to the ship, hoping to close the gap before the fog erases all sign of her. He is no longer an independent inshore operator of his own boat, and the fish he's caught are at the end of plenty. Today the painting shocks us with the wild beauty and formidable danger of our former fisheries, and a warning, not of fog, but of how quickly a good thing can disappear. Uh, I, this passage really moved me when I read it um, the first time, um, partly because I, I grew up with a painting of a reproduction of Homer's in my house that was similar to this, not the same painting, but, but w what really struck me was um, this idea of that sort of way of life going away, the sort of owner-operator of a fishing boat um, kind of 
having to hire himself out as just a hired gun to like a larger sort of corporate entity and um, and how that kind of was the the harbinger of kind of the end and um, I mean it's it's really sad and we just had a cooking class at our shop a couple of weeks ago and Micah Woodcock who I think you probably know he's in the book <laughs> um, I thought he was. He, yeah. he is a um, he's a wild harvester, seaweed harvester in Maine, and he works in Penobscot Bay. And you know he's an owner operator, so he's just one guy. Sometimes he works with a couple other people, but it's basically one person who, you know, it is this sort of traditional way of life. Um, and he when he goes out, it's him against the waves, kind of like you were talking about, but he gets to make all the decisions. And um, we're kind of coming to a time where, so somewhat with harvesting, but also with seaweed farming, there's starting to be more corporate interests um, coming into the field, um, which is exciting in some ways, because it means seaweed, the seaweed industry is growing. Um, but it, it kind of echoes that, that painting by uh, Winslow Homer where um, we kind of know what happened next, not only to the resources, but also to these individuals who were once the masters of their own destiny and now they kind of ended up um, working for less and probably in worse conditions because uh, they were hired out to these big corporations. So. Well, you know, it's kind of interesting. I've been asked now to write a column for Down East, and my second essay um, is about Sarah Redmond, who has a whole chapter here. And um, she also is an independent operator, but she's not a wild harvester. She uh, uh, grows seaweeds aquaculturally out in a bay in Goolsboro. And um, it's her first full ownership of a company. And the thing is, in this essay I'm writing, which is only 600 words, so it feels like a haiku, is I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to say, without beating my readers on the head, because if I did that, Down East wouldn't publish it, <laughs> um, is, you know, that's the great thing about Maine, is the independence and hard work that we still think is an ethic here. And it's in the seaweed business still. It's probably, like everything else, will be overwhelmed by big corporations. But I hope not. Because I see people who are very conscientious, who go out in the bays who study the seaweeds like Micah does. I mean, he didn't even start harvesting for a couple of years because he wanted to find out where the best kelps were and where he could cut and they could grow back. In other words, he's a caretaker as well as a harvester. And I love these people and I love their courage. So I don't want them to be swept away in a tsunami of corporate America. That's my prejudice. Yeah. Yeah, well, and along those lines, I, I think, like you said, that Maine does have this tradition of um, sort of, I guess, um, small-scale operators. You know, the lobster industry is still pretty much, you know, one person, one boat to some degree. And um, other places aren't like that. You know, this uh, this spring, actually, as I was starting up the shop, um, the seaweed company from Alaska came to visit Maine on what essentially amounted to like a um, a, a little research grant from the Alaskan government. Um, they make they make kelp salsa, and I I said, wow, you know, you must um, there must be all sorts of amazing stuff happening with seaweed in Alaska. Um, because they have some amazing species, and they said, no, nope, we're, we're the first and only people doing anything with seaweed. And, and I said, why? And they said, you know, the, the fishing industry in Alaska is, has so corporate and so large and has, has such a just dominance over everything that um, no one, just there was no interest, no one 
Um, there was no room for it. No one really gave it a chance. And so they're, they're this young couple who's starting this, but whereas they came to Maine because we have an industry that's 40 or more years old, it's fairly mature. Um, there's a bunch of different companies. Um, there, we probably, in terms of the United States, have the most well-developed and um, diverse set of um, companies doing seaweed, which means that at least we have a chance to kind of keep it, um, keep some independence, which I think is really exciting. Um, uh, a couple of things I was thinking about when you brought that up is one thing I should tell you is, even though Josh said that my book is mainly about the Gulf of Maine, which is true, I take you to Ireland. I also take you to the Pacific Coast because I want to tell the story about <clears throat> the bull kelps and the giant kelps, the uh, orca whales, the gray whales, and the sea otters, and the, um, now I forgot what they're called, sea urchins. Um, and how, uh, because what I'm trying to learn and teach, I'm, I'm learning as I write, as well as teaching. And what I'm trying to learn and teach is this, that these systems are so tightly woven that we break them without even knowing that we're doing so. And we can't afford to do it anymore. We have to pay close attention. And the thing about paying attention is research. And research is fabulous, but it costs money. <laughs> so, uh, I believe that if citizens are interested in seaweed as habitat for wild lives, as good things for them to eat and, and go to Josh's store and buy, and as supplements, careful supplements for um, uh, the great big industrial soybean and corn farms out in the Midwest and stuff, if we can take good care of it, which we haven't done before, but we've learned a lot about what happens if you don't take good care of something. And we, we, it seems to me we want to do well. Am I being Pollyanna-ish about this, do you think? I think you're right. Um, I think just like you, uh, many of the people you talk to in the book, it's, it's one of those things, everyone wants to do the right thing, but... Um, I think you mentioned somewhere where in here the tragedy of the commons or right. something like that. And it's hard to do because people also have this innate desire to get a, want a little bit more. Right. So it's this tension probably within most people that everyone wants to be a good person, but we also want. Just a little bit more. That's what, yeah, yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have a quote here if I can find it. You don't mind if I take, <laughs> uh, oh, here. Paul Molino is in the book, and he was a fisherman. He's up in uh, Washington County. He also won a Fulbright, I think it was a Fulbright, to write a book about fisheries. Really smart guy. I mean, it's so exciting to go visit people about seaweed because they're really smart and they're really interesting, don't you think? And they've got opinions. And they, they don't always agree either, by the way. Anyhow, he said the most wonderful thing. We don't know how to assess the value of species within their ecological communities. So we tend to think of them as worthless rather than priceless. Isn't that great? Would you like me to read you a bit more? How can, how can you say no? <laughs> No. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's see if I can find the part about my kids. Uh, before I wrote, uh, after I wrote the part called the Underwater Forest, because I knew I had to introduce you to the science of seaweed, how they survive in the water and everything. But I wanted to start out with when my children were little and how we used to go to the shore. Actually, their dad dug clams for a living. 
And I worked in a fish factory. And I have to tell you, this was in Prospect Harbor. I have to tell you that I was told that I was the slowest cutter of fish they had ever seen at the factory. <laughs> um, but after this chapter, I take you out to meet a woman who is a shepherd, and she, her, her sheep are on an island. And I explain how they overwinter there and how the Scottish and Irish tradition of keeping sheep on islands was brought to this coast with the first white people. <clears throat> when my children were small, I took them to the shore. It would be low tide, and we walked over the pebbly mud and parted the seaweed strands, the bladder racks, the knotted racks, attached to the big rocks that the glacier had dragged with it from miles, from miles away. We peered beneath the seaweeds, the outer layers had dried in the air, but the under layers held a briny wetness that made the creatures we found within especially bright. Starfish, the egg capsules of dog whelks, small sea snails whose eggs looked like tiny Greek amphora, green crabs as new and small as my children's fingernails, young green sea urchins, limpets, sideways swimming scuds, yellow periwinkles, and sometimes a hermit crab or a sea anemone. It seemed right somehow to be bringing young and growing children to the edge of the bay where life had evolved so far back in time that it was hardly imaginable, as if this place with its seaweeds were proof, excuse me, were the proof we needed that we had come from a world of water and that everything might have looked at what time, one time, as something like this. When we are children, our psyches tend to become imprinted on the places we know and love. And for many of us, that edge where water and land meet is one that stays with us all our lives. I didn't think of it then, but now I believe I was offering them exactly this, their home place to imprint upon, so that they might go into the larger world with a sense of where they come from and thus a sense of who they are. I have a question for you. So your grandmother ate seaweed. Yeah, so uh, I was just thinking about that in my childhood when you were reading that and it was very moving. Um, so, so my grandparents were from St. Stephen, New Brunswick, which is just over the border in Canada. And um, she moved down to the Lewis and Auburn area in the 30s when she was just a kid um, with her parents. They, they came to work in the shoe mills. And, um, and so they sort of brought, in Canada, um, it was more of a tradition to eat dulse, which is this reddish purple seaweed that's really delicious. Um, and so in the 80s, I guess, when I was a kid, it, you really could not find it anywhere um, around. And maybe by the end of that decade, maybe it was in a few health food stores. But every couple of summers, we would go up to St. Stephen's, St. Stephen, New Brunswick, and y you would get dulse. Like in August, it was the big harvest time. And um, the, my dad says they would only sell you so much. Like you could get a couple bags, but he, he would try to get more. And, <laughs> Got it all kind of marked out to, to different people. Um, and I remember going to the visitor center right over the border, and they had a display about Tulsa and big wooden barrels where you could just get it for free, which was amazing to me as a kid. <laughs> um, but that rings so true that it's this thing that, you know, I was brought up with and just really stuck with me, just that connection to the ocean. You know, we loved going to the ocean. Um, we loved eating... Um, seaweed, and um, it just always stuck with me. And it was when I was living away from Maine for a long time that I really got back into seaweed and started really getting excited, excited about it and thinking, what could I, how could I like get into this world? I, I can't go back to school for like marine biology, but what could I do to sort of get my foot in there and, like you said, meet these people who are super interesting? Yeah. So you figured out how to do it. 
exactly. <laughs> well, I learned from writing this book, and it's in this book, that um, Shep and Lynette Earhart, who own uh, the main coast sea vegetables, and I spent a day working with their workers there, uh, cleaning dulls, you know, and stuff like that. But they said Canada, Grand Manan Island, is the best place in the world for dulls. And here's why. They um, take wooden boxes, they pick the dulls, and then they weight the dulls down, but they keep it slightly damp. And it begins to not rot isn't the word. What is the it's word? Almost like a, it's almost like it's a live <laughs> enzyme food. So yeah. the enzymes start changing the flavor almost like a, a good cheese or something like that. So right. It's active and it, and it changes over time. Right. And so it's very um, uh, easy to eat and it has a delicious quality. And so everybody wants dulls from Grand Manan. Yeah. Supposedly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, what should we talk about now? <laughs> um, did, did, you, did you have another reading? Oh, sure. But before, I, I want to tell you how I started this book. Because, as I said, I'm an essayist. And so, I was reading off to my agent. She's in an office in New York on the phone. And a list of essays... To, that would be in a new book that I thought were just overwhelmingly uh, fascinating. And she was totally silent. <laughs> For a minute, I thought she had hung up. <laughs> uh, uh, the truth was, as you already know, is that she didn't find it very compelling until I got to go, wanting to go out with somebody I know, Andrea De Francesca who is a seaweed harvester near where I live. And um, she, Andrea told me she'd take me out for the day and we'd harvest kelps together, which is also in this book because I ended up doing it. And my agent said, Susan, write a book about seaweed. And I hung up and I thought, that is the stupidest idea I've ever, really. Nobody cares about seaweed and also, how could you write a book about seaweed? Because there's only about two sentences you can say about it. Um, but because she was my agent, I decided to look into it. And it is like falling down a rabbit hole. And so I began to write about it. And I said, okay. And I wrote a book proposal, you know, which you send around, she sends around, to other publishers. So she was sending around to these big publishers and they got back to her, well, it may be well written, but you know, nobody's going to buy a book on seaweed. Or, well, maybe this would make a good article, you know. And that was about five or six years ago. And the world has changed. And I think one reason it's changed now, oh, Algonquin, by the way, bought the book. They, they took a big chance on it. And then they had no idea it would take me five years to write. They thought, maybe two. And, and I said, I, at about year three, I said, um, I'm still doing research. And they said, oh, come on, you know everything about you. Well, I don't, you know, I have to go ask people. But we have lost so many species in the ocean. We have so much attention about that, as well as um, climate change, that now every new species that we find, every new encounter with something that still is uh, robust in the ocean, we want to make sure we can protect as well as harvest. Well, that, and if I could just follow up, um, I think part of the interest too is that we all have to be interested in seaweed. Um, one of the reasons is that the UN, you know, we know that the population is exploding and by 2050, I think it's going to be like 35% larger um, on the earth. Um, the UN has also kind of reported that most of the arable land on the surface of the earth has, is, is already being used. There's not a whole lot left. 
Um, and currently, we are only getting 2% of the world's food from the oceans, and we all know how, that that is, in large part, we're doing it in a pretty poor way. Um, so it's pretty clear that we need to start getting more food from the ocean. Um, and so, but at the same time, we need to be careful about it. And seaweed does have the potential to um, be really sustainable and actually mitigate some of these issues. It's true, um, yeah. Helps, at least in a, in a sort of local setting where it is, it, it does help um, um, mitigate um, a, a carbon dioxide. Yeah. It sequesters carbon, uh, produces oxygen. So, you know, there's a lot of um, promising things with seaweed in terms of that. So, the funny thing is, we've always actually been using it. We just didn't know it. There's a part. Let's see if I can find it here. here this is still in the prologue. I'm going back instead of forward here. How much time do we have? Good. If you ask people to guess the next big harvest that we will take from the world's oceans, how many of them would say seaweed? They might turn over in their minds what they know about the Atlantic cod fishery and its collapse, maybe the American and European eel fisheries and their collapse, or the collapse of the sardine fishery in Northern California and the North Atlantic, sorry about this list here, or the vanishing of the anchovy fishery off the coast of Chile. They might mention the loss of the wild Atlantic salmon or the recent implosion of the shrimp fisheries in the Gulf of Maine and the Gulf of Mexico. They'd say, right, it isn't those. Nor could it be the Atlantic halibut or swordfish, yellowtail flounder abalone, or Alaskan king crab. They too are depleted. What's left, they'd ask. Most of us cannot get through a day without meeting seaweed in a disguised and processed form in toothpaste, puddings, pie fillings, and other soft foods, in makeup soaps, dog and cat foods, cattle feed, and farm fertilizers. Many people in the world, especially in Asia, eat seaweeds daily as vegetables, sugar kelp, valeria, and laver, carrageenan, and dulse, wrapped, stirred, chopped, or sprinkled, dried or steamed or simmered in soups. So what's in your store? Yeah, all those things that you mentioned. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, an, it's seaweed. I think you mentioned elsewhere in your book that it, you know, it has the word weed in it, and I think a lot of people really think of it. Um, you know, they, all they know is it's on the beach and it's, it smells bad because it's rotting. Um, and I always just say, well, if... You know, all we knew of tomatoes was them rotting in the sun. We wouldn't like tomatoes either. <laughs> but yeah, one of the great things about seaweed is a little goes a long way. And a lot of these cultures that um, have, have sort of continued to use it, um, like a lot of Asian cult cultures, um, they don't need a lot. You know, it's a little bit sprinkled on or just a little bit wrapped around something. Um, it imparts a lot of flavor and also provides tons of really important nutrients. Um, so yeah, we, you know, I, I think in order to preserve something and to really understand the value of what we have, we need to get, we need to see it as this valuable food, I think first and foremost, ahead of anything else. Um, you know, it's, it's an additive in toothpaste and ice cream and all these things where it's invisible to us. Um, but especially now with this huge growth of eating local and organic, um, the foodie culture has just elevated food and farmers to this, you know, almost godlike status. And um, I think if we can do that with something like seaweed, we'll, we'll see the value in it. And so uh, a lot of the things that we have, obviously we have the dried seaweeds where you can um, cook with them, but a lot of things are sort of to get people to dip their toe into the seaweed waters, as it were. Um, so I started doing sea, um, seaweeds combined with uh, caffeinated her and herbal teas a few years ago. That's kind of how I, I got started in it. And the idea was like, oh, tea is something that people drink every day. And um, these taste, maybe have a bit of a seaweed taste, but they taste, you know, um, together it, it tastes pretty good. Um, so it could become part of a daily habit. Um, and there are other companies that are doing 
things like sprinkles. So you just sprinkle a little bit on whatever you, food you're having. And um, we have another company here in Portland, Oceans Balance, that has um, kelp puree, which doesn't sound very appealing, but <laughs> it, it makes it easy. And so you can just scoop a couple scoops into soup, tomato sauce, uh, pizza sauce, uh, smoothies. They had a smoothie demo at the shop recently, and it was delicious. It's like putting kale in your smoothie, something like that. Um, so I think you know, we need to just find creative ways to get this into more people's diets, and I think that will really up this perceived value of, of what we have all around us. Um, Sarah Redmond, who I just told you I was writing about, um, and I have written about, she's my go one of my go-to people, um, said, uh, to, um, to follow up on Josh's point, it's the nutrient density of seaweed. It's not that, um, as he said, a little bit will go a long way. But we're doing a lot of studies now about what is the best way to take in seaweed because we found that, for instance, the Japanese that have had a long tradition of eating seaweeds, their, um, the bacteria in their guts can digest that seaweed better than perhaps some other cultures. It's not that we, it's not useful to us because it is, but that um, we may not know or our bodies may not know yet how to use all the aspects of it. That's open to question, but they are studying it. And some biologists believe that a good way to use seaweed is to put it, for instance, on your garden or to feed it to fish so that you eat something that has sort of metabolized the seaweed in a different place. I don't know if that makes sense or not. But. Well, and, and I mean, a lot of people eat fish for the omegas, um, which is a great example. Fish don't produce omegas on their own. They get it from seaweed down the food chain. So um, that's an interesting sort of thing. We all know about, oh, fish have omegas, but where are they getting it from? Well, then it's, you know, that, then it's really important that we take it from the seaweed source and not take all those fish because we're overfishing right. for the omega oils. Go talk to your health food store. Oh, yeah. Um, let's see. Shall I read you something else uh, kind of quickly? Let's see, we have about five more minutes. Uh, Chapter 5, page 70. I loved, I, um, I have to tell you, uh, I loved writing this part um, about Ireland. My, um, I'm part Irish and part English, and the English part of my family was overpowering, so the Irish were very quiet about being Irish. And so, so when I grew up, I was very loud about being Irish for a while. So here is um, here's something about what I found out about who I am. Occasionally you can still find them out on the islands, crumbling near the water's edge, the old 18th and 19th century kilns built out of stones gathered from the shore. People on the Irish and Scottish coasts and in Brittany cut and burn seaweeds in the pits of those kilns to make potash and pearlash valuable potassium salts. The wet seaweeds, Ascophyllum, Fucus, and the kelps, had to be lugged up from the shore, carefully turned and dried, and then burned at a temperature that would render them into products that were sold to make glass and soap to be bleach linens to encourage bread to rise and to use as fertilizer to sweeten fields. In the boom time, around 1809, Ireland was exporting about 5,410 tons of potash a year. It was backbreaking work that the whole neighborhoods engaged in, and at its height, the many kiln fires created smoke so thick it endangered the lives of nearby pasturing cows. 
It wasn't long before the seaweeds in some places were overcut, the shores laid bare. Then, as suddenly as it had appeared, the market vanished when potassium salt deposits were discovered underground in Germany and in Chile, and mines were open. The burning of seaweed resurfaced with the discovery that the ash residue could be used to extract iodine, but that too disappeared when deposits of iodine were found below ground. Left alone, seaweeds regrew, with farmers coming to the shore to harvest them for their gardens and gatherers cutting favorite species to eat and to feed to their domestic animals. Over time, the old kilns were disassembled by wind and rain and snow. My great-grandfather was born in County Mayo, a land of blanket bogs and clay on the western shore of Ireland, facing the North Atlantic. He was just a boy when he sailed to America with his parents in the 1860s. Somehow, they had survived the famine. Even today, you can see the ghost of the famine that provoked their flight, and that, that of so many others, in the ridges on the Mayo Hills, old shapes of potato gardens suddenly abandoned as if time had stopped, and in a sense, it had. Um, so I, I write about how to make a potato garden, but I want to read you about the Aran Islands. Is that okay? Yeah. On the Aran Islands, there is only an occasional thin skin of turf over bare rock to make a lazy bed. A lazy bed is a potato garden that the Irish um, developed, and it is very hard work. So, of course, they called it a lazy bed. Anyhow. The old-time farmers would collect sand from the beach coves, mix it with decomposing seaweeds and what little there was of turf, and make their own soil into which they set the potato seed, then shoveled more of the dirt and sand and seaweed mixture over the seed, building up the beds with channels for rain runoff on either side. In his 1907 book, The Aran Islands, J.M. Singh wrote, Quote, the other day, the men of this house made a new field. There was a slight bank of earth under the wall of the yard and another in the corner of the cabbage garden. The old man and his eldest son dug out the clay with the care of men working in a gold mine for transport to a flat rock in a sheltered corner of their holding where it was mixed with sand and seaweed and spread out in a layer upon the stone." End of quote. It may be a seaside farmer's prejudice, but it's claimed that nothing tastes quite so good as a potato grown in seaweed gathered from a nearby shore. I'm sure that's true. <laughs> they, want, they want some right now. <laughs> um, well, we have 15 minutes left. And I should say, um, open it up to questions and also just point out if anyone is really into birds, there's a lot about birds in this book as well. So if anyone has any questions about how that relates to, um, feel free to, to speak up. But It's true. My passion is birds. Yeah. Yes? What would you consider a daily consumption appropriate of a CD? I think I have a postage stamp size somewhere. Yeah, um, I am fairly good friends with Micah Woodcock, who we, we talked about earlier, who's a harvester. And so he's much more wide read than I am. But I, I believe it's much higher. Um, you know, people say different things. Um, the seaweed in the Gulf of Maine is. Um, extremely clean. Um, the, the Gulf itself is fairly clean. Um, so there's no radiation or heavy metals or anything like that, uh, which I think is the big concern with like things from the ocean, especially fish. Um, and then really the only thing that I think um, concerns people with overeating of seaweed is iodine, which is really good for you. Um, and 
I've had it explained to me different ways. I think if you have thyroid issues, you should probably talk to your doctor. You may need more iodine in your diet. You may need, you may need less. Um, but other than that, um, basically your body takes as much as it needs and the rest flushes out. So like everything, it's kind of like, you know, do, you know, don't, everything in moderation, but I've, I've been eating seaweed my whole life and I'm, I've been fine. He looks pretty good, um, actually. Yeah, Micah is like... <laughs> He's really a hundred years old. Exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think it's fairly good. I, I kind of always just direct people back to do your own research, but there's a lot of it out there that you can find online. But I would certainly sit, say postage stamp size is probably way smaller than, than you need to, to worry about. Um, just, oh, can, may I, um, can, yeah. Um, you wouldn't want to eat seaweed right where the um, Penobscot River flows into the bay, because they're still cleaning up contaminants there. Our Gulf of Maine, of all places, is so clean um, that people can cite, who cite their seaweed farms, or who are cutting seaweed, know that they can um, actually get MAFCA to certify them as organic. And MAFCA is pretty darn strict. And if you remember correctly, when Fukushima happened, um, people on the West Coast were very afraid of eating seaweeds there because seaweeds will take in whatever's in the water. And if what's in the water isn't good for you, they'll take it in. And so they began to buy seaweeds from here, from the Gulf of Maine. And that hasn't let up. And so suddenly, somebody else's bad luck became uh, a possibility for us. And um, now we're trying to step up because however much we produce, people will buy more. They want more. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, just to follow up on that, do you address like, the fact that seaweeds are kind of the canary in the mine and stuff? Like, for example, there are overgrowth of seaweeds um, in the Gulf of Mexico at the moment. Uh, this usually was like a cyclical, seasonal, sargassum sea origin. Right. Now it's coming from the Amazon because it's one of the uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. So, do you address the fact that also? we get signs from the ocean and from the seaweeds about actually what we've been dumping into the sea for. Yes, so that's photos of what people have just seen. Uh, are, you, are, you, are you from Brazil? I'm, I'm yeah. French. So. You're French? I'm from Brittany. We do put Brittany. potatoes with... Brittany's in my book. Um, yes, I address that because that's very important, I think is first of all, um, there are two kinds of sargassum. Uh, this might go on too long. I mean, let's see, how do I keep it small? The kind of, in the Sargasso Sea that floats out there in the southern Atlantic is not the same kind that's washing up on the beaches in um, the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean. And it's true, exactly what he said. The Amazon because of all the cattle farming and the cutting of the trees and everything in the new towns, the raw uh, nitrogen is coming out of the Amazon. You won't believe it. It hits north, that stream. It's like a dark ribbon of water. That mixes with our lack of being careful about what we on the islands put into water and in the Yucatan, and along the coast of Mexico. So in other words, my idea is this, uh, having learned it from reading this book, I mean, writing the book. Uh, I haven't read it in a while, but I wrote it. Um, is This is, has to be an international effort. It can't be country by country. Look at all the countries that that pollution goes through. To, and the thing that is terrible is this. So they got piles of this sargassum. It's a different species of sargassum than the sargassum sea. Piled up on the beaches. The tourists come. The people depend on tourism. And the tourists are just appalled. 
Not only that, but that sea turtles, the babies that struggle out from the sand, they, they're just struggling out under a, a wall of seaweed, and they can't make it up through it. So it's not good. And I would like to know how we're going to make the Amazon a good uh, conservative conservation-minded place, we as all the people of the world, as well as making the Arctic a place that also it doesn't get too dirty. <laughs> so we have a lot of work, and we have to do it internationally. And I see somebody walking up here, so I think our time is up.